Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see so many faces. I see some large groups are in attendance today. That's that's really fantastic. Uh, my name is Matthew Morris. I'm co-chair of biology at Ambrose University in Calgary, Alberta, and I am thrilled to be your moderator uh, this afternoon. Today's event is sponsored by the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, otherwise known as the CSCA, uh, which is in fellowship with the American Scientific Affiliation, uh, otherwise known as the ASA. Although regionally separated, the CSCA and the ASA have the same mission to act as a fellowship of scientists and those interested in science and to facilitate research and dialogue on how science should best interact with the life-giving Christian tradition. Now, I first became aware of the ASA through its publication Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. Uh, I found a box of old journals over at a Bible college where I was doing my undergrad, and uh, I immediately felt a kinship with the authors of those papers. They were asking questions that I deeply wanted answers to, things like, is there a Christian responsibility towards the environment? Uh, what were Darwin's religious beliefs as he wrote The Origin of Species, and how did his theology did? How should one read the days of Genesis 1? Then I discovered that students could become members of the CSCA for free and that this would give me access to electronic versions of the journal. Uh, I've been a member of the CSCA ever since. I've presented at several of their conferences. I've met some wonderful Christians in science from across North America, and I've been challenged to think more deeply about how what I do relates to my faith. So to that end, I understand that there are students here today from uh, Alberta, from uh, British Columbia, and, and perhaps from some other provinces or, or states. So if you are a student and you aren't already a member, uh, consider going to the CSCA website and, and signing up. You can see it here on the screen, and I'll, I'll uh, post a link where you can become a member. But again, membership is free for students, so why wouldn't you? Uh, we have some events coming up. Uh, if you're uh, enjoying today's event, there's an event on uh, Thursday, December 1st with uh, E. Janet Warren from the Hamilton chapter, so register for that. Uh, and there's also some diving deeper discussions that are happening that uh, I believe I'll be participating in come January. So uh, make sure you, you join these. Uh, these are opportunities to meet the authors of the papers that are published in the ASA's journal and to, to ask questions about the papers that they've written. So it's, it's a great uh, opportunity to fellowship together. Also, please note that we have a winter symposium coming up uh, in early 2023. And this is very exciting. We have our uh, conference, the ASA's conference coming up very soon next summer in uh, uh, July to August of 2023. And what's amazing about this particular conference is that it is the 50th anniversary of the CSCA. And so it is happening in Canada. Uh, it's going to be happening in Mississauga, Ontario. Uh, the theme of the conference is moving forward together, the future of science and faith. And so it'd be great to see uh, a lot of new uh, Canadian faces there this year. So consider becoming a part of that. Now, I first encountered our guest speaker uh, today through the pages of the ASA's journal, Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. In the midst of the pandemic, as people became increasingly isolated and, and uh, dare I say even polarized, Dr. Rebecca Dielschneider published a paper entitled Vaccine Hesitancy, Christian Reasons and Responses. And I'm going to put a link to her paper in the chat momentarily. Now, this paper was a breath of fresh air. It took a compassionate and empathetic stance on a challenging subject. So in 2021, I invited Dr. Deal Schneider uh, to present a talk on her paper and, and was really encouraged when she said yes, and the talk was outstanding. I'm going to post a link to her original talk, which was recorded in May of 2021. Um, it was an excellent event that sparked some really great dialogue, and I'd encourage you all to see that. And I'm thrilled, then, that Dr. Deal Schneider has agreed to follow up on that talk today. Dr. Rebecca Deal Schneider was born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She obtained a Bachelor of Science Honors with Co-op in Microbiology and Immunology at Dalhousie University, after which she worked at the National Microbiology Laboratory and at Immunovaccine Technologies Incorporated. 
Rebecca graduated with a PhD in the Department of Immunology from the University of Manitoba in 2016. She's been listed as one of Manitoba's future 40 under 40 and uh, leads the CSCA's local chapter in Winnipeg. Currently, Rebecca is Associate Professor of Health Science and Department Chair at Providence University College in Otterburn, Manitoba, where she teaches biological and health sciences and has research interests in the pedagogy of immunology and the understanding of vaccine hesitancy. So without uh, further ado, please, from your homes, uh, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Rebecca Schneider. Thank you for that kind introduction, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. So today I'm going to talk about vaccines, faith, and trust. I have a deep temptation to just talk science all day long, all the time. So I could share a lot of science like I have done in past talks. I could discuss the studies that have found that vaccines limit symptomatic and severe infections, limit hospitalizations and save lives. Like the studies here, I could talk about vaccine efficacy. I could discuss how that vaccine efficacy wanes over time and changes. I could discuss the studies that show some of these emerging new studies about how vaccines decrease transmission. And likewise, I could talk about the rare but serious side effects that some vaccines have. So I do love talking about science. I tend to do it quite often, but it turns out that this science talk doesn't necessarily always do a great job addressing mistrust. So it won't necessarily address mistrust. This slide is quite busy. There's lots of citations of journals here. In this particular column, I could actually only have room to put in the original articles from the New England Journal of Medicine. Obviously, there's many other studies that I could have cited on this slide. But this science talk doesn't always do a great job of addressing mistrust. And mistrust has certainly been evident in this pandemic. Many medical doctors and scientists have been researching this topic, have been trying to understand it further and deeper. It is of much interest. And some have even said that alongside this COVID-19 pandemic, we are having a pandemic of mistrust, as you can see in some of the articles here. And I'll define what I mean by trust and mistrust in just a moment. Before COVID-19, trust we saw was increasing, at least according to our Pew Research Center um, series of studies. You can see that in these years leading up to COVID, the number of people that had a great deal of confidence or at least a fair amount in scientists was increasing and some increase in medical scientists specifically. However, since the onset of COVID in 2020, we've seen a decrease in this trust. And almost a quarter of participants here have not too much or no confidence at all in medical scientists and scientists in general, and even a little bit in the military of the United States. So there has been a slight change here. You'll note that still the majority of people, 78 to 77%, have a fair amount or a great deal of confidence in scientists, but a number of people don't. And this is of, of note, of concern. So hopefully you'll see why I'm interested in this topic and why I've chosen to talk about not just vaccines, not just science today, but also trust, especially trust as it relates to we as Christians, people of faith. So hopefully you see my rationale here today. Um, over the next few minutes, I'll first define trust and what trust in science is and looks like, and then I'll provide various reasons for mistrust that the literature has discussed and that also that I've experienced as I've talked to a lot of people about vaccines. I'll hone in on two common phrases, two common responses or quips that I've heard a lot about and perhaps you have too, and then I'll conclude with a summary and just some notes on the importance of trust and why we need to keep talking and investing in this area. So today I've organized my um, reasons for mistrust into various categories, but before we get there, I just want to define this term of trust. What do I mean when I say trust? It's a term that you probably understand already. When I say trust, I'm just speaking about confidence in someone or something. So when I talk about trust in science, I'm saying that trusting in science means that scientists and scientific institutions are trusted providers of information about the natural world they study. Scientists focus on nature, on the natural world. A biologist of birds 
can be trusted to give information about birds. And a, a different type of scientist, maybe a scientist that studies stars, can be a trusted source of information on those distant celestial bodies. And likewise, scientists who study vaccines can be providers, trusted providers of information about those pharmaceutical formulations. And so this is what I mean when I talk about trusting in science. So what are the reasons that people don't, don't trust in science or mistrust? Well, again, I've given these in categories, as I mentioned just briefly a moment ago. And the first category, I think, for reasons of mistrust is historical events of either the recent or distant past. And so the first point here about unethical experiments, unethical practices, certainly perhaps we can all think of some instances in the past of medical research, of scientific research broadly that has acted unethically. And this can sometimes give us some individuals reason for pause. Perhaps you're, you've heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study of um, in African-American males where a treatment was, was knowingly withheld and where unethical practices um, were quite severe. Also, the forced sterilization of Indigenous women here in North America. There are a variety of unethical practices that make certain people groups quite mistrustful and, and hesitant, make them pause when it comes to science. And they do have good reason for that. The second point here about failures, uh, there's lots of mistakes in scientific history because scientists are people and people can make mistakes. And in the, um, uh, in the line of transparency, I actually wanna go into some of the details of what some have called vaccine failures in the past. Maybe some of these you've heard of, maybe some of them you haven't, let's dive into them. I like these sorts of discussions. So the first one I'll talk about is in 1955, and I'll just, I call this cutter polio here. This is where a batch of polio vaccines was accidentally produced with live virus instead of virus that was inactivated. And so instead of priming the immune system, it infected the recipient. This caused a polio outbreak in the United States, which led to around 200 cases of paralysis, some permanent, and 10 deaths. In incredibly unfortunate. It's commonly called the cutter incident, because two production pools of bad vaccines came from the same company, Cutter Laboratories in the United States. Just a few years later in 1960, there was another incident with polio vaccines where an estimated 10 to 30% of polio vaccines in 1960 um, were contaminated with the simian virus 40 or SV40, a virus that we know some things about. We know that it can have the potential to induce cancer in certain situations, but a virus that we still don't understand completely. So as you can imagine, many studies ensued to see if individuals that received these contaminated vaccines were harmed in any way. And the majority of the studies concluded that there was no clear cause for alarm. However, this is something that we are still following into the future to ensure that no increased risk of, of health complications have resulted. The studies are ongoing. The next failure I want to mention is with a very different type of vaccine. In 66, a formalin inactivated, that's what the FI refers to, um, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. A vaccine was given to children in four different clinical trials in the United States. So this was an experimental vaccine at this stage. We were testing it out in a human population. And it ended up actually making some subsequent RSV infections worse in these children who received it. Uh, and so several were hospitalized and two young children passed away as a result. For this reason, it seems like the pharmaceutical industry really took a pause at looking at RSV vaccines um, for many years to ensure that we didn't repeat this history. But we're actually seeing some really encouraging results now of a new RSV vaccine. Maybe you've seen that, that will be given to, that has been given uh, in a trial to pregnant women to ensure that when their newborns come out of the belly, they have some antibodies against this harmful virus. The next failure I want to mention is with a different type of vaccine here, RotaShield. This was the first vaccine against a disease caused by the rotavirus, a very different pathogen than polio or RSV. 
This virus causes inflammation of the digestive system and quite debilitating and severe diarrhea and is a significant cause of death worldwide. This first vaccine was licensed in the United States in 98 and was given to many children subsequently, estimated at about 100, or sorry, 1 million children. And unfortunately, it was found to slightly increase the risk of interception, which is an intestinal folding or blockage that can be severe if not caught. Thankfully, no children died as a result. As such, it was promptly and voluntarily withdrawn 10 months later after it was approved. The next failure I want to mention is with Denvaxia, so a very different part of the world here, going a little bit further away from North America. This vaccine was approved in the Philippines, an area where all of this, the serotypes of dengue are endemic. And it was given to over 800,000 school-aged children over the age of nine in the years of 2016 to 17. The company that made the vaccine, Sanofi Pasteur, after it was initially approved, released some updated information that they just analyzed that showed that vaccination could be harmful for some select children who had never been infected with dengue before. They contracted dengue again after they were vaccinated. There was a chance for more severe infection. Dengue is a very interesting infectious disease, and so we can dive into that more in the question and answer afterwards, if you like. So thus, as you can imagine, there were several children that received this, this vaccine that became sick. 19 of the vaccinated children went on to uh, pass away from a dengue infection, presumably worsened by the vaccine they initially received. These vaccines, you may still hear about them because they are still used, but now they are only used in times when individuals can be confirmed to have dengue before. So they're not dengue naive. So this vaccine does still have a use, just not in a, a mass population that may not have seen dengue before. And then a more recent uh, example and closer to home here in Canada with the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. You probably remember this viral vector vaccine was given to many adults in Canada and the UK and beyond. After its initial approval, it was discovered to have a very rare but serious side effect that we call vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VITT, or VIT, a problem essentially of platelets. And this problem can be fatal, can be difficult to treat, especially when it wasn't anticipated. The last report that I read in Canada had tallied five deaths from this side effect caused by this vaccine. So I review these examples to be transparent, to highlight some of these historical reasons for mistrust that perhaps you or others have heard of, and to also discuss them a little bit. I think in all of these examples, we see failure, costly, deadly in some cases failure, but we can also take um, uh, it's some confidence in the fact that as soon as the failures were caught and they were caught early, then adjustments were made. And all of these adjustments were made within months or within a short year. So I think we can take confidence that they were not covered up. Indeed, all of these failures, all of these experiments are well discussed in the scientific literature and in the media. You will have no problem finding scientific papers discussing all of these incidents and ensuring that we don't make these same mistakes again. With all of the other COVID-19 vaccines, I actually checked the other day and we now know that we've given out billions of doses around the world, billions of doses around the world. And over the last several years, we can be confident that the side effects we detected early on are the side effects that, we'll, that um, we will only see. Indeed, when we study other vaccines, uh, we know that decades out, the, the outcome tends to just be a longer, healthier life. We don't see long-term complications down the road. So these historical reasons of recent or past history um, are certainly cause for some mistrust. In addition to these, I have this category of personal or social factors. So we know that people of certain ethnicities, of religious identities, people of particular political identities, and also those of various geographies, whether we live in urban or rural environments, we know that these factors can play a role in how certain individuals view science. 
We know that people of certain ethnicities, given the past unethical experiments and the existing racism, not just in medicine, but systemically, we know that this can be a significant barrier to individuals in the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. When we talk about religions, evangelical Christians tend to come up in many studies as being one of the slightly more mistrustful groups. Uh, and many religious scholars and, and theologians have actually made a connection to the history of this evangelical movement, the Reformation. And it makes a lot of sense to me how in the Reformation, we decided to not let church leaders um, be the main source of, of scripture and of interpretation, but rather give that um, responsibility to the people. And so if we don't need church authorities to read and interpret scripture for us, then maybe we don't need experts in other areas. And so you can potentially see how evangelical Christians and others have expanded that thinking and applied it to this pandemic and to other experts. I think about the um, urban-rural divide quite a bit. Um, because universities and industries in science and elsewhere tend to be found in big cities in urban environments, it makes sense that a lot of the scientists that work there live close by. They live in urban environments too. So that's people in rural communities outside of those big cities simply don't rub shoulders with scientists at the grocery store or in their churches. So scientists can seem like a foreign, very different people group and challenging group of experts to uh, get to know. This last point in this category is just the impact of science. We know that sometimes a general public may not have a problem with science itself, but may have a problem with what it means for their everyday lives. The impact of science, for example, we can see in farming. Farmers may resist genetic modification of crops, but they may not have a problem with the science of genetic modification, but rather they may have a problem with what it means for their farms and food systems at large. The idea that seeds and foods can be intellectual property, for example. The idea that fields can have to be weed free is another example. Likewise, some people who are vaccine hesitant don't always have a problem with the vaccines or the science itself, but they may just worry about how governments and workplaces enact things like vaccine mandates, what that means for their everyday lives. I know for in my workplace, for the six months where we had a vaccine mandate in place, I know that there were other options given to test regularly or to work remotely. But in these situations, it seems to be the influence of science on public policy that has some people concerned. So some people are hesitant about science. Some people are just hesitant about what science and technology are doing and changing in their day-to-day -day lives. The next category here is actually about science itself. And so just the characteristics of this field, of this discipline that can sometimes breed mistrust. The, factor, the fact rather that science is largely secular, that it's complex, that it's uncertain, all of these features of science can tend to rub people the wrong way. Not every scientist is a secular person. Sure, I, there are many atheists and agnostics, but many studies have found that a third of scientists are religious or spiritual in some way. So not all of them are secular. Of course, we know of some really loud, influential voices that are voices of people like Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Richard Dawkins, et cetera. Their videos, their writing, their debates are really popular and often portray religion in a negative way. I'm thankful that these voices are the minority. They don't speak on behalf of the scientific community in the majority of these cases, they're sharing their own personal opinions. The next point here is just about elitist um, and the institutions and industries of science. Um, oftentimes, they can come off as proud, as nose up in the air. Oh, I'm a scientist and I know a lot. And sometimes people take um, issue with the fact that some industries, especially pharmaceutical industries, are making profits. This can rub people the wrong way because they are profiting off the production of medical, pharmaceutical uh, formulations, vaccines, treatments, and things like that. 
The fact that science is continually moving and progressing and how it changes over time can make it seem shifty to some people. And so some people find this nature of science to be a reason for mistrust. And lastly, just the scary outcomes. Yes, science can lead to scary things. The science of nuclear reactions can cause harm if applied in certain ways. So this goes back to my point up here about how some people worry about the impact of science on their personal everyday lives, on societies. Certainly there is the opportunity for science to, to lead to some scary outcomes. So it has to be uh, applied cautiously. My last category here is about communication or it's communicative. Sometimes in communication, there's a perceived lack of transparency. I've tried my best to pull the curtain away today and talk about anything that someone may be interested in. But it's difficult because science is complex. It is really detailed and that detailed nature is just increasing in complexity over time. It's becoming more and more specialized. And so communication efforts are meeting more and more challenges in this regard. It's really difficult to distill complex scientific studies for popular media. Sometimes communication can even seem conflicting and it can be really confusing and hard to follow. One day eggs are bad, maybe the next day eggs are good. It can be really difficult, especially with diet and, and nutrition, to follow the trends and the advice and the ever-evolving information. And then lastly, just sources of misinformation. Misinformation is, is information that misleads, that's not accurate. And disinform disinformation is outright deceitful. And so these sources really bombard viewers and can make it really difficult to discern what is accurate, what is trustworthy, and what is not. And so these can certainly be reasons why some mistrust science. So hopefully you've seen as I've walked through all of these categories, these reasons, the bulk of what I've read and experienced about um, mistrust in science. Hopefully you see a lot of variety, a lot of difference here. Um, Maya Goldberg explains this nicely in her book about vaccine hesitancy, public trust expertise, and the war on science. She says that disputes about science are never about the science alone. Had a category here about science, the aspects of science that can be um, that can breed mistrust in some, but there are so many other factors at play. It's so rarely, perhaps never, about just science or the science alone. So I'd like to offer some responses to these reasons of trust before I move on to look at some common phrases here. So allow me to respond here. In response to the historical unethical experiments, failures in the distant or more recent past, we have to acknowledge that science has made these mistakes. And scientists do acknowledge. I acknowledge them. They are part of our training. They are part of our textbooks. There are so much literature about this. So indeed, the mistakes are costly and have been deadly, but they have not been covered up. We know about them, we acknowledge these, and we train future generations and improve our procedures and our practices more and more and strive to do better. Mistakes will happen, but we are making significant progress. We are doing our best to learn from history. Regarding some of the personal and social reasons for mistrust, I just wanted to point out that science Scientists are a diverse group of professionals. We see scientists everywhere. There are 8 million of us, give or take, around the world. If you get to know some of them, you're bound to find some that are just like you, that vote like you, that live where you live, or maybe were born where you live, that have the same religion, ethnicity as you and others. Naomi Oreskes, author of the book Why Trust Science, says that in diversity, there is epistemic strength. Our epistemology, our ways of knowing are strong when we come at it from diverse perspectives and different viewpoints. And this is one of the reasons why we can trust science is because scientists are diverse and they're such a large collaborative body of professionals. In response to some of the aspects of the scientific field itself, indeed, we we know that science is complicated. There's no way we can do away with that complication. But as I'll mention in a moment, perhaps there's better ways we can communicate and talk about it. 
The fact that science is a social enterprise, that these, this diverse group of professionals works together, collaborates, we train for many years, devote ourselves to our fields, and we really are trying to work and do our best to understand the natural world and address the challenges that we see and further our understanding. So yes, there could be some scary outcomes. Yes, science changes over time. Yes, our institutions and industries aren't perfect, but we're doing our best and there's no other alternative. And I think we just need to invest in science more and improve it to the point where it's the best that it can be. And then just lastly, we know that there are significant problems with our methods of public communication. And I'm confident that as we study this further, as we invest and train more and more communication professionals, I'm confident we will address these issues and we will see improvements in the communication of science. Nowadays, with so many different devices and different platforms, it's really hard to reach viewers and the, the public, the population. And so it, it's a challenging field, but I'm confident that as we are investing more and more in science communication and in science communicators specifically, communicators that are trained in science, we'll see communication efforts that try to draw the curtain aside uh, and be as transparent as possible to communicate, alleviating the uh, potential conflicts and fighting back and addressing some of the misinformation out there. So I argue that even given all of these reasons for mistrust, I argue that science, including the science of vaccines, can still be trusted. Scientists and scientific institutions are not infallible. Failures can happen, have happened, will probably happen in the future. Mistakes happen. We're people. We're human. But science is the best we've got. It's the best way for us to understand about the natural world. We have no alternative. We need to invest our efforts to make science the best that it can be. When, after much investigation, debate, peer review, and publication, if scientists arrive at a consensus, if this diverse body of professionals can agree on something, well, then the general public can place their confidence in that. It is trustworthy. So I want to shift gears a little bit to kind of the second part of my talk here, and I want to address two common phrases or, or two kind of common narratives that maybe you've come across. I certainly have. The first one here is this. I don't trust science because I can do my own research. This uh, individual, this grumpy face here, implies that they don't trust scientists and thinks they can do that role all on their own, that they can make sense of scientific research without the help of scientists as interpreters. The majority of people I heard that have said that they are doing their own research are not researching, but rather they're reading. And reading and research are not the same thing. Of course, researchers do read, but they do a lot more than just reading. Research is methodical, it's systematic, there's observations, there's testable hypotheses, there's experiments, there's interviews, there's arguments, there's comparisons, there's analyses, and so much more. So yes, research includes reading, but it's not simply reading. Reading doesn't make you a researcher, but it still is really useful. It can help non-experts gain some understanding so that they can develop good questions to ask the experts. If a warning light comes on in your car, perhaps you open the compartment and find the operation manual and read a little bit about that warning sign or that light that you see, so that when you bring your car to an expert, a specialist, a mechanic, you can ask some informed questions and you can talk about it in an educated way. Likewise, if your doctor recommends you receive a vaccine, you can certainly read up about those vaccines so that you can have an educated and informed conversation with your healthcare professional. You can discuss the efficacy and the side effects and the things that you're concerned about. So reading isn't bad. It's really good. It's really useful. It's just not equivalent to research. And I want to say that no one is calling for blind trust. When we talk about trust in science, we're not saying trust it blindly without question, without comment. 
you should read, you should be critical, you should ask questions. This is what I love about academia. And when the church does this, this is so fruitful as well. So you should do this. And if you do this from a from a humble perspective of seeking information, then those questions should be well received and it should lead to some good conversation and discussion. The next common phrase that I want to talk about is a little bit more personal to those of us of Christian faith. Perhaps you've heard of someone say something like this. I don't trust science because I trust God instead. We've heard about this saying and, and this overall position for many years. It's been around for a very, very long time, decades, if not centuries. Um, and so even in the years before the COVID pandemic, I kind of brought in a headline here of just before the COVID pandemic in 2018, where a Christian televangelist in the United States, Gloria Copeland, encouraged her followers to inoculate with the word of God instead of with the flu vaccine. And it was a very bad flu year. So there were many people promoting flu vaccines at the time. Other news stories in the pandemic have featured people with painted cars or with signs that say trust in God, not vaccines or not pharma, as you see here. In a way, these statements sound like a false dichotomy. In a way, it presents two options, trust in science or trust in God. It implies an either or, no, where, nothing in between and no overlap. It also makes the two sound mutually exclusive. You can trust in God or you can trust in science, but there's no way you could do both. You can inoculate yourself with the word of God, read scripture, or with a flu vaccine, but this individual is implying that you can't do both. Of course, we at the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation disagree. We say you can do both. And there are so many great talks that highlight fabulous scientists that do science, that trust their colleagues and their work, but trust God ultimately as well. And I'll explain and, and discuss this a little bit further. So it sounds like these are opposites, that they're mutually exclusive, but the CICA and other organizations of faith and science say, of course, they're not. And to drive home this point further, I, I actually want to turn to a really common story in scripture, a scripture that myself, someone who's not a biblical scholar, hopefully won't screw up. <laughs> so I want to talk about um, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan in just a moment. Before that, I'll, I'll just comment on this a little bit more and kind of set up that parable for us. So I think one good thing about someone who's saying something like this is, or, or this phrase is that clearly this individual understands that we are called to have faith in God, that this is a priority. And our faith is really important to us. It should be priority number one. But our faith can't guide us in all aspects of our technical lives. It can guide us in aspects of life, in terms of wisdom, of love, of knowing God, but it cannot help us fix our car, fly a plane, or test a vaccine. We must trust professionals in these technical areas. Indeed, mechanics go through rigorous training, as do pilots, as do scientists. That education helps them in their technical occupations, and our faith helps them in a different way helps them understand God, helps them understand love, helps them see meaning and purpose in life. And I think this next quote from C.S. Lewis says it all. He wrote this in an essay, Christianity does not replace the technical. The emphasis is his here. When it tells you to feed the hungry, it doesn't give you lessons in cookery. If you want to learn that, you must go to a cook rather than a Christian. Maybe when scripture tells us to love people and take care of the sick, Maybe we can rely on technical, scientific, and medical experts to show us how. Just like this quote says that a cook can show you how to feed the hungry. Vaccine researchers fight really hard, long days with often little pay, to prevent sickness, to keep people from getting sick, to prevent infectious disease so people can live long, full lives. Trusting in science is not a sign that you lack faith or that you're living in fear. It's a sign that you are trusting that God sends people. You are trusting in God's servants and their God-given gifts. And you realize that God uses people all around us every day. We see this in scripture all the time. God using diverse people of diverse giftings for his purposes. 
And I'll highlight this more as I now get to the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I know this is found in Luke's gospel. In response to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds and then tells this story. We know that a man who seems Jewish is walking and is beat up and left for dead. We can see him lying here in this painting. A priest and a Levite then both pass. And I love this painting because you see them in the distance and you even see one looking back. They've passed on their way and haven't stopped. Next, a Samaritan passes by. He pauses and he helps. He treats and he binds the man's wounds. He took him to an inn. He helped and treated him there and he paid for additional care as well. This is a story I'm sure many of us have heard. It's a story that perhaps some of us can recite by memory. We know a bit of the roles of the people who passed, the priest and the Levite, seemingly religious roles, a religious vocation. They perhaps spent their days in the temple. But interestingly, we don't know the role in society that the Samaritan played. We know their ethnicity, but we don't know their occupation. Was he a carpenter, a trader, a shepherd? Was he a farmer, a warrior, a government official? The text doesn't say. Maybe it doesn't specify, maybe Jesus didn't specify a particular occupation here, because maybe in this context it didn't matter. We can maybe think that anyone can be a good Samaritan, no matter their training, no matter their occupation, in this story, no matter their ethnicity. A pilot can be a good Samaritan, a custodian, a mechanic, a scientist. We see this countless times through scripture. We read the stories of how God spoke to people of the Old Testament and how Jesus dwelled with people and left his Holy Spirit with his followers in the New Testament. We see time and time again that God works in diverse people, in diverse and sometimes mysterious ways. When I read this story, I'm encouraged because it, I, I can think of anyone who is, can stop, use their gifts, their training, their resources, and have compassion on people and do their best to help someone who's in need. I want to acknowledge that sometimes it's really difficult to put our trust in someone, especially someone we don't know, someone from a different walk of life, perhaps a different ethnicity, like in this story. But just like this man here trusted this Samaritan, perhaps he had no choice, no alternative. So too, we can trust people that are different from us, especially when we have no alternative. There are no other experts in the natural world aside from scientists. So in summary, I started off my talk defining trust and mistrust and painting a picture about why it's important to study these sorts of things and then walking through various reasons, historical, personal, social, scientific, and communicative. And I'm sure there are more than simply those reasons, but those are the ones that I've encountered in my experience and my research and what I've seen talked about a lot in the literature. Science acknowledges these significant mistakes in the past. I don't want to downplay those mistakes, those failures in any way. They happened and there were some really terrible outcomes. But with better discussions, with improvement in vaccine production and assessment and better communication strategies, we are doing better and we hope to rebuild relationships and regain some trust. And then I walk through a few common phrases, perhaps those that are doing their own research. And it, I will admit the research that I see individuals saying they are doing is more like reading, which is good. That's not bad. Keep that up. It helps you ask informed questions and have educated conversations with experts. And then if you are trusting God, well, you don't have to choose between trusting God or trusting science. We can trust God, his word, the Holy Spirit to guide us in every aspect of our life, but we can't expect the Holy Spirit to give us technical information about flying a plane, fixing a car, or assessing a vaccine. We have to trust that God has enabled servants the body of Christ with valuable gifts and expertise to help us all make sense of the technical aspects of life. God works through diverse people, regardless of their occupation. So as I conclude, I just want to point out why I think trust is so important and why I chose to talk about it today. 
Firstly, we know that trust is an important part of relationships. I'm married, maybe you are, I'm sure we all have some friends. So trust in a marriage, in a friendship, even in our broader church community and community as a whole, we know it's important. We know that trust is part of relying on one another. If we are to live in community, not live alone, then there has to be some trust. The band Panic at the Disco incorporates a lot of religious themes in their music. And the lead singer is not a religious person anymore, but he was raised in a religious household. And I really enjoyed how that band has navigated some religious themes in their, in their art, in their work. And one, lo- one line of their song, I just can't get out of my head. It says, and if you never know who you can trust, then trust me, you'll be lonely. Trust is an important part of relationships. And if we are always mistrustful of everyone, then we will not have any relationships. Trust is also important for the church's mission, and it enhances the church's mission. This quote from the theologian jo- Josh, Josh Reeves, um, I think, explains this well. But to ignore what scientists know, reflected in the consensus of the scientific community, or mock scientists when they update their beliefs in light of new evidence, is to fail to follow the golden rule. Treat other intellectual communities in a way that you want them to treat Christian theologians, and I could add biblical scholars. If we want people to trust us, when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about love, when we talk about what makes faith alive for us, if we want people to trust that message, we have to trust them in return. It goes both ways. So trust enhances the church's mission. Now that I'm done talking, I'd like to share some, or now that I'm done, the main message that I wanted to share with you today, I just wanted to share some suggestions for further reading. I have really enjoyed reading a few books um, of the Bible lately, especially some of the Psalms and the wisdom literature these days. There's just so many good pieces, wise passages here. Um, And I thought I would particularly talk about the book of Ecclesiastes, because honestly, there's a few pessimistic verses here that have resonated with me on the hard days in this pandemic. Indeed, with wisdom, sometimes comes more sorrow and grief. Sometimes I wish I didn't know. And I found myself actually laughing and finding some humor in the repeated phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, chasing after the wind. Just seems really applicable in this pandemic. Not only are we focused on an airborne pathogen that is transmitted in the air and the wind, but as these variants change and new ones evolve, I feel like we are always chasing after something that keeps changing like the wind as it changes direction. So I just think that this book has taken on new meaning for me in this time, and maybe maybe you would enjoy reading those passages too. There's two books here that I've quoted in my talk, Redeeming Expertise by the theologian Josh Reeves and Why Trust Science by Naomi Oreskes, a historian of science. I think these books both tackle this topic of science and trust in really interesting and complementary ways, so I recommend them to you. I'll end by just providing my email, my Twitter handle, and just thanking you for your time and attention today, and I'm just really looking forward to your questions. I want the the remainder of today to just be a discussion I want to hear from you. So thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Rebecca. Yeah, let's give a, we can give a warm round of applause from home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, That was so good. The, the, the empathy and compassion and the patience that you have for, for people who, um, reject some of the science, the good science, scientific work that you do. Um, it, it's a real encouragement and example uh, to me. I, I tend to get, uh, you know, I have a PhD in evolutionary biology, and it's really easy to get frustrated by those who are um, uh, distrustful of the work that I do. And just the way that you read them in the best possible light uh, is is really good example for the rest of us. So thank you so much for that. Now, there's a lot of questions that have been coming in, Rebecca. So uh, we'll just sort of dive dive right in. The first one uh, is coming from uh, an Ambrose undergrad, which I'm delighted to see, the very first question to come in. Uh, and his question is this, does opposition to mainstream scientific ideas, such as evolution, among evangelicals, 
have an association with mistrust in vaccines? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for it. Um, I definitely think that we see some trends in that. And so an individual who could mistrust um, evolutionary biology may also mistrust other fields of science. But honestly, it really depends in the context. And so in the, qu in the question that was just asked, the context was in um, evangelical Christians. Uh, and so in that context, we can see overlap, mistrust of science for a variety of reasons, really any science that perhaps conflicts with the way that we are taught to read scripture um, or just with our overall church environment, I think, our church climate. And so we know that there are some environments where um, mistrust of science is uh, quite broad and it includes evolutionary biology, vaccine science, climate science, and more. So I do think that there are some connections when we look at the reasons for mistrust in our evangelical communities, but not always. It's complicated. And I think beyond the evangelical community, uh, I, I don't think we see some of those same overlaps. Yeah, well, one of the things I noticed was, you know, organizations like Creation Ministries International came out very strongly pro-vaccine during the pandemic. Mm. Um, and friends of mine who follow them rejected them on that message, <laughs> but accept them on on everything else, which I thought was an interesting development. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've wondered to some extent, uh, uh, how how is the church in, in its consistent sort of messaging um, pre-adapted people to just reject all scientific authority, uh, at least in, in, in these particular areas? I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that, Rebecca? Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about some of the passages in the Psalms and elsewhere that warn us of worldly wisdom. So I think sometimes that is applied very broadly. And when I read those passages, I think of the worldly wisdom that, you know, it says there is no God and that religion and, and spirituality is futile. futile. Um, and I think some people take that and just really stretch it to mean any wisdom of the world, any wisdom that they take any um, conflict or, or, or disagreement with. So I think sometimes it's passages like that that are shared in our church communities. And even like I said in my presentation, the history of the Reformation, just taking things into our own hands and relying on ourselves and our own personal relationship with God um, is, is sometimes difficult when we remove ourselves from communities, from body, from experts that can help us discern together. Um, so we have, there, there's some anonymous questions that have come in. Um, so th this person's asking, well, they're saying that they've been discouraged lately, that the general impression that the average secular person has of evangelicals is that we're more selfish and more foolish than the average Ooh. North American. Mm. Our, our general reaction to COVID vaccines seems to be a clear example of this to many in our society. How can we turn this around? That is such a great point. And I share that observation. Um, I have a lot of science friends and I'm, I'm connected to a lot of scientific communities, mostly in immunology, microbiology, and cancer. Um, and so many people that I'm connected to in those contexts know me as someone that goes to church that is religious, um, that believes in God. And so they have aired their concerns with me significantly and said, why is this church doing this? Why is this church fighting against uh, uh, meeting capacities and mask requirements uh, and things like that? And they say, don't you as Christians love people? Like, isn't that something you're supposed to do? And that has discouraged me significantly. And so I wrote down the word selfish and foolish that the person asked in their question, because I, I think there is a bit of that perception out there. I've seen that in the scientific communities that I'm plugged in with. And it is concerning. So how can we address that? How can we fight that? Um, I think we can do our best to try to, well, I mean, the, the church is doing so many good things, but sometimes it's just the bad stories that make it into the media. Oh, this church has done this, or this church has not done that. And we need to just keep doing all of the ministries that are 
that churches are well known for. We need to keep volunteering. We need to keep feeding people, taking care of people, driving sick people to the appointments they need. As we keep doing what we should be doing, I think that message will change and people will see us doing the things that they expect us to do and say, okay, that is a Christian that's loving that sick person or that's visiting that widow or that's tutoring for free or volunteering their time in this way or that way. We just need to keep doing those basics and keep serving in the ways that I know we are. And sometimes we have to get creative in the pandemic. We can't, we couldn't serve in the ways that we did in the past. And so not getting stuck down and bogged down by, oh, darn it, I can't do what I, what I was doing before. We just need to be optimistic and say, okay, what can we do differently? And how can we still keep serve in this changing world? Hmm. That's a, gr- a great point that we, uh, we might not be able to change that story that was shown on the news, but we can exemplify Christ to the, to our friends in what we do. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's so good. Um, There's another, there's quite a few anonymous questions who've come in because I think this is just so personal for people. Mm. Um, I've lost a lot of faith in the integrity and honesty of my pastors for how they reacted to vaccines, masks, et cetera. So this person Mm. wants to know, am I being unfair? Wow, what a great question. Uh, I'm sure they're not alone. Maybe I'll acknowledge that right off the hop. This has been a challenging time for everyone. And I think especially a challenging time for pastors. I know of so many pastors that think, well, vaccines and science should be in a category with politics and we just should not bring it into the (laughs) church. Those are polarizing topics, so we just shouldn't talk about them. And I think when when pastors and churches make those decisions, they are forcing people to discuss those topics elsewhere. In a, in a situation where maybe there aren't other Christians to, to join together with. And so I know personally, like it's easy to be critical, but I look at what pastors are doing and I see a lot of good and I see a lot of sure room for improvement. Um, but, you know, I, I think we have to cut, e- cut each other some, some slack here and just realize that their jobs have changed drastically. And I can remember when my church returned to some in-person services, all of our pastors just wept because they had missed people so much. And that was just their job. That was part of who they were. And so they, they are experiencing some significant challenges, no doubt. And I think efforts like Science for Seminaries, an effort that I've been involved with here at Providence and and, an effort that has helped many other seminaries is useful because we're trying to build more bridges between our theologians, our pastors, our church workers, our church leaders, build more connections between them and the scientific community, just so that if a church wants to dive into this in a Tuesday night Bible study, for example, then we can enable them. We can help them. And maybe these topics don't need to be spoken right from the pulpit, but if the church doesn't address them, then the congregation is just left to themselves to figure it out. And I think that that's really hard and dangerous. Hmm. So um, this person's asking, during the pandemic, I was so disgusted by anti-vax disinformation that when vaccine mandates came out, I was immediately in favor of them. But now I'm not so sure. Do you think we jumped too quickly from being pro-vaccine to being pro-vaccine mandate? Mm. I believe anti-vax folks are dangerously mistaken, but I'm not sure they should be coerced into doing something that they believe, albeit mistakenly, will harm themselves. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, vaccine mandates and a lot of the restrictions that were enacted in the pandemic I'm sure we will spend a number of years looking back on that time and asking ourselves questions like that. Like, were we right in choosing that or timing it or this, that, and the other thing? It, a really stressful, polarized time. So in terms of the vaccine mandates, um, I'm thankful that they were short-lived. I think when they arrived, the intention was to lessen the burden of what what seemed to be a really deadly wave approaching. And so I know that they were enacted with the best of intentions, not to coerce people, but rather just to keep more people alive, right? And so um, I know some people in my church, they they did feel coerced 
to be vaccinated. And that dismays me. Obviously, we don't want to coerce or force anyone. I know for a lot of the vaccine mandates that were enacted, they were either short-lived or other options were available where someone could participate virtually um, or by distance or test regularly instead of opting for a vaccination. And I think those options are important because they limit the coercion um, and, and just the pressure that I think people have felt. But it is a really interesting idea looking back at those vaccine mandates. And I'm sure that our, our health policy experts and our ethical experts will be yeah, analyzing those responses in the years to come. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. I, I know I personally have found it quite um, challenging to, to walk a line between mm -hmm. like being very much on board with the science, but not always on board with all the political decisions that are being made, but not wanting to lead that to distrust in the science. Mm -hmm. I don't know, do, you, do you have any tips on how to navigate that? <laughs> Maybe if I can share one other comment about vaccine mandates. Um, let me see if I can choose the best words here. Um, yeah, I remember when my institution was first, not like toying with the idea, but there were hints that this could be coming. Um, I remember thinking like, well, maybe instead of doing a mandate, maybe if we just put out a poll to actually see the level of vaccination in our community. And if our staff and faculty and students were 90% vaccinated, then maybe a vaccination mandate wouldn't have any effect. And so I think like, obviously, every workplace, every educational institution, every public service will differ. Um, but I, I think maybe there are more strategies we can adopt in the future, in addition to vaccine mandates. Maybe those are appropriate in some situations, maybe they aren't. Maybe there are other alternatives that can be just as successful. I have, I have a student with a sort of follow-up question to this. Hmm. Um, what would you say to individuals who felt like they betrayed their faith to get vaccinated? Maybe they're having a hard time hmm. reconciling that feeling with the science behind vaccines. Yeah. Okay. Can you read that question one more time? Yeah, I just sure. want to think yeah. on that. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what would you say to individuals who have felt like they have betrayed their faith in a sense to get vaccinated? And maybe they're having a hard time reconciling that feeling with the science behind vaccines. So I think maybe if I hmm. interpret the question, I, I think what they're asking is, so there's somebody who feels like they betrayed their faith. Uh, when they got vaccinated, they felt like their faith told them you cannot be vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. But they do think vaccines work. They, they've seen the the science of vaccines is saying that vaccines are good, uh, mm -hmm. but they felt like they were betraying their faith when they got vaccinated. Uh, so I don't know this particular the context here, but I certainly know we've had students um, whose whose family uh, they have very strong connections with their very religious family, and their family says you cannot get vaccinated. And the student felt kind of, and, and we had a you know the the mandate you you can be on campus vaccinated or you cannot be on campus. Um, and I I don't know if that student chose to be vaccinated, but let's say they did, and now they're violating their relationship with their family and their relationship, which is very much intertwined with the relationship with God. So I can imagine the guilt that one would feel there. So mm. what, what, what what would you say to contexts like that? I think the the first thing that comes to mind, or just the thing that I'm moving around in my mind at the moment, is that they're probably not alone. And if they talk to a lot of other Christians, I think they will find that many of us have chosen to be vaccinated. I know I have. I know many other Christian scientists have as well. Um, and I think maybe just chatting with other people that think about vaccines a little bit differently than the families they grew up in or the churches that they're attending, they can maybe see how we've reconciled it and how we make sense of it and how it doesn't conflict with faith as we've as we know it. Um, I think the more we talk about this sort of stuff, just the better, right? Like, not, let's not sweep more things under the rug. That always gets us in trouble. And so if someone's feeling conflicted in this way, talk to someone about it. Talk to your pastor. Talk to other church leaders. Talk to scientists if you know any. You can send me an email, too, and if you're, if you're comfortable. Um, I think just talking about it simply can help address some of those feelings. Maybe it won't take it away. Maybe those feelings will remain. I, I can't predict, but at least it 
can help us work through it and acknowledge them. Mm -hmm. um, one resource that I recommended after my first talk was Christians and the Vaccine, a series of videos with various different pastors, biblical scholars, Christian workers in different contexts. And I know for me, it's been really encouraging to see all of these different people in different walks of life all say, yes, I chose to be vaccinated. And yes, I still trust God and have a strong faith. Um, I think the more we see role models like that, the more we can show people that this is this is a good choice if they choose to make it. Hmm. Maybe to the, the the violation of one's conscience is perhaps one of the big issues at play here as well, that they felt like they mm -hmm. shouldn't get vaccinated, but they felt compelled to get vaccinated. Then they did it. Now their conscience is being violated. What, what would you say about what, what should their approach be there? Yeah. I mean, I, I still sort of going back to just talking about it. <laughs> um, but if, if, yeah, if they made a choice that conflicts with them, pray about it more too. just ask God to open your mind to other possibilities. Maybe that guilt will remain. Maybe it won't, maybe it will be reconciled. Um, yeah. Just trying to work through that in prayer and conversation. Um, yeah. And I'll think more about that. Maybe there's something else that will come to mind later on that I could share. Um, so we have uh, another, uh, this, this one's pretty long. I'll do my best with this. Um, they'd like to know if you could explore and elaborate on faith-based misbeliefs, specifically Christian ones in relation to vaccines, including this person says anti-vaccines which may include one one's fundamental beliefs in God and interpretation of certain scriptural passages. One particular challenge for strong believing Christians, the blind trust that one's strong faith will make him or her immune from becoming a victim of a failed vaccine, especially in the clinical trial mm -hmm. phase, um, i.e. unable to subject oneself to being subject to risks according to statistical rules and seeing it as a necessary sacrifice for the larger good, but he, she may not be a beneficiary of the new vaccine or any new drugs or medical treatments. Um, I might need to think about <laughs> reword that, that one. Uh, did, do you get the question there? Do you want me to maybe read through it one more time, just because there's a lot there yeah. and I want to so, do my response justice to it. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm reading it faithfully too. So they want to, they would appreciate if you could elaborate and explore on faith-based misbeliefs, specifically Christian ones in relation to vaccines or anti-vaccines, um, which may include one's fundamental beliefs in God and interpretations of certain scriptural passages. One particular challenge for, and they put in quote, strong believing Christians, the quote unquote blind trust that one's strong faith uh, will make him or her immune from becoming a victim of failed vaccines, especially in the clinical trial phase, being unable to subject oneself to risks according to statistical rules and seeing it as a necessary sacrifice for the larger good, but he, she may not be a beneficiary of the new vaccine. So I think, I think maybe what they're asking and maybe the person who asked this question, if they want to send me some uh, clarification, um, but I think they're asking about like those people who, who got vaccinated first uh, subjected themselves to the potential risk of, of, of undue harm. And so some Christians sort of held back and said, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait and see uh, whether there's adverse side effects. But I'm not going to put my own sort of personal well-being uh, in harm's way. And others who are like, let me get in there first uh, and, and you know, it might kill me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, do you have any, any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a lot to think about there. So thank you so much to whoever asked that question. It's really yeah, there's a lot to think about. And I think the person who asked it is thinking through these in a really thoughtful way, too. Um, where should I start? Um, maybe I'll kind of start with where you just ended off and where I, a theme that I think I see in, in this series of questions. Um, certainly signing up for a clinical trial or for a newly minted vaccine has some risk, especially in light of the mistakes and the failures that we've seen in some new vaccines in the past. Um, and so I'm thankful that there was no vaccine mandate on day one, because 
I, I think we understood that there was always the, the chance, the risk, and we saw that play out with the AstraZeneca vaccine, and even the slight risk of myocarditis that we see after the mRNA vaccinations. There's always risk when you vaccinate a large, large, large population that you start to see more of those really rare events that we didn't see in the clinical trials early on. So there is risk, and I hope that no one felt like because they didn't sign up to get the vaccine on day one that they weren't doing a good job. I know of a lot of faithful Christians, wonderful people, who just paused and waited um, six months, a year out. I, I seen I see no problem with that, as long as they are adopting other methods to limit the transmission of the virus, to to help <laughs> uh, stop the the waves and the severity that we've seen in this pandemic. Unfortunately, there are a number of studies that I've found that individuals who hold on to anti-vaccine beliefs te tended to not adopt other methods of preventing transmission in the infection, so or preventing transmission in this pandemic. And so, for example, there are a lot of studies that correlate anti-vaccine behaviors with anti-mask behaviors, with behaviors that have still led them to congregate in large groups um, to not stay home when they're sick, to not wash their hands even. So we know a lot of those behaviors are correlated. Individuals who, some, not all, but some individuals who are against vaccines tend to be against those other measures as well. And I think that that finding is, is worrisome. Like I myself, um, I am fine to work with people who are not vaccinated and to get to know and be friends. I, I have friends, I have coworkers who are not vaccinated. And my interactions with them have not changed even after I've heard that information. But I hope that if one chooses not to vaccinate, that at least you're choosing other ways to keep people around you safe. Um, so you don't need to feel coerced to get a vaccine, but if you're masking, if you're staying home when you're sick, if you're washing your hands, if you're avoiding crowding spaces, if you're avoiding events that you anticipate will be super spreader events, um, yeah, I just think we need to think about all those factors together. Um, I think there are a lot of faith-based faith, faith misbeliefs that are circulated in Christian communities. I think just our desire for truth can sometimes lead us down a path where we are looking for truth elsewhere, truth that we think or suspect is being censored or withheld from us. And so I think that, sorry, do you hear my dog in the background? <laughs> He's barking a little bit. I, he probably sees a bunny in our backyard. Um, so I think some of that can come from a good place of, of being cautious and, and trying to balance different viewpoints. Um, but I also think that some of it just comes from a blatant disrespect or distrust of experts at large. And so hopefully my talk try to encourage people to work with work with all of us to work with diverse groups. People have to lean on you. You have to lean on other people. That's how a community of believers, that's how the body of Christ works. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were aspects of that question that I didn't mm -hmm. adequately address. So feel free to repeat any of them, Matthew. Yeah, he he has um, sent a, a bit of a clarification on the question, but I think, I think he addressed quite a bit of it. Um, he wants to know about this pitfall or the, the trap of believing that as a Christian, we are unique or special enough to be protected against random events. And I think that goes right. both ways. Like we're special. Mm -hmm. God's going to protect us. If we get vaccinated, we're special. God's going to protect us against COVID if we're not vaccinated. Right. That's such a good point. Thank you for reiterating that because that is something that we can, that we should definitely discuss. Um, yeah, I'm tempted to talk about seatbelts here because a lot of people have made that connection in this pandemic, that there are other methods we as people, we as Christians adopt to keep ourselves safe. And we can still confidently say that we put our trust in God and buckle our seatbelts because God has blessed us with a car with a seatbelt that can keep us safe if ever we we're in a motor vehicle accident. And so too, I trust God with everything. And I take all of the gifts that he has given me because I don't want to sit idle. I know that deeds matter. Um, and I know that there's ways that I can help. And so taking a vaccine, making sure that I stay home when I'm sick, et cetera, are ways that I can do my best to help everybody. God does work in mysterious ways and sometimes miraculous ways, 
but miracles aren't the default. Miracles by definition are special. And so we can't expect to God for God to miraculously protect us when, from all infectious diseases because infectious diseases will keep coming. And maybe instead of working in a miraculous way, he's working through his servants in natural ways by developing vaccines and therapeutics to help those that do end up getting sick. Yeah, I do love this idea of of God inspired uh, a science. Like maybe mm-hmm. not every aspect of science, right? Uh, but um, to to think of of medicine as something that God has inspired scientists with as a sort of uh, revelation in a way uh, of of mm-hmm. how the natural world works and and how we can use it to heal the nations. I think that's that's powerful stuff. And I think the more Christian scientists we hear from, like in the United States, there were two big names that were talked about quite a bit. Francis Collins is obviously someone who's named quite often. Um, but Dr. Casey Kemma Corbett, her last name is Corbett for sure. Um, she was, she is a fantastic Christian scientist, fantastic Christian, a really faithful person from what I read of her work. Um, And just an amazing scientist, an amazing scholar. And hear her talk about her work, you just can't deny that this is the passion that God has placed on her heart. And this is the way that he is using her. Um, I think in the way that he's using a lot of people in science. Hmm. Um, We have quite a few questions still in the 10 minutes remaining. And I want to get to some of these undergrad students who've been sending some questions in. Um, I don't know if anybody's grading this, the student, but Noah Stevens from Trinity Western is asking a question. Uh, (laughs) How do you think the internet and blog based sites have influenced the spread of misinformation and mistrust? And how do you recommend dealing with those who strongly adhere to these blog based sites, which spread misinformation and mistrust? Sometimes speaking as a Christian and a scientist only makes people dig deeper into their beliefs. True. And I can see that. Thanks, Noah. Noah, was it for the question? Yeah. Um, yeah. How to combat the misinformation that's spread on blogs and various websites through social media. That is such a significant challenge in communication. Um, someone who I've taken a lot of my leads from is Timothy Caulfield out of the University of Alberta. Maybe some of you in Alberta know him because he is local to you. Um, he specializes in the debunking of misinformation, um, especially health-related misinformation um, spread by celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow and others. Um, so it is a huge challenge. There is no easy way to do that. Um, his simple formula is just to debunk Um And so if someone says, oh, this blog post said this or that or the other thing, you could say, well, this isn't what the scientific literature says. Here is the consensus. Here are two papers that clearly disagree with that. Um, And I think doing so in a not angry manner is important because it's really easy to alienate people. And like you said, it's easy for people to just dig in deeper when they feel like they're being attacked. I think that Christian mentality, right, like the world is out to get us. And can sometimes put us on guard against all forms of people, even those that are trying to to, to help and to teach. Um, and for those of us that aren't scientists, like there are some really nice resources that you can share, like Christians and the Vaccine um, come to mind. And there are a few like science bloggers. Um, the Friendly Neighborhood Epidemiologist comes to mind. So she is an epidemiologist that looks at disease patterns and whole populations. Um, and she's a Christian. Her husband is a pastor. And she just has a wonderful blog. Um, talks a lot about the Good Samaritan, which influenced my choice of discussing mm-hmm. that story here today. Um, and so it takes work. It takes effort to come back with other sources of information. But I think we have to do our best to gently encourage people to think about alternatives. To think, okay, if you read this and think it's true, then why don't you read this paper or watch this video to see if you still hold that belief when presented with something that says something different. Mm -hmm. And also just not alienating people, right? If we unfriend people, unfollow, or just keep avoiding conversations with people who use those sorts of information and, and follow a lot of the misinformation on social media and on blogs and stuff, that's just not helping I know sometimes for our mental health, it's perhaps in our best interest. Um, I know for myself, I haven't unfollowed or unfriended or anyone in this pandemic because I don't want to push people away. I, even if they think differently than me, 
I'm hoping that we can still grow together, even if we're growing in different ways and even if we still hold different viewpoints. Um, yeah, so let's not be too quick to distance ourselves from people that think differently than us. Um, so we have a question. You mentioned trust in vaccines. What are your thoughts on the level of trust that Christians now have in vaccines, um, considering mm. it's been a while since the vaccine's been developed and we've had these mandates in place? Yeah, I don't know of any study that's come out really recently to address that sort of question. I would hypothesize that trust has increased somewhat, especially since we're two years out now from the initial rollout of those vaccines. I mean, some people are still mistrustful because we'll probably need annual boosters moving forward. And so they think that vaccines have failed for that reason. Um, I mean, annual boosters are not uncommon. We give boosters in a variety of vaccine contexts. Flu is obviously the best known example, but there's lots of other vaccines that require boosts. And we're just in really unique territory right now. We've never had a pandemic of a coronavirus before. And so we just don't know exactly. We have some predictions, some models, some ideas about how the next few years will look like, but we can't know for sure. And so I think just accepting some of that uncertainty is, is healthy in this conversation too, because we, we can't know for sure what's going to come. Yeah, that, it, it, do you know, is it going to be a once a year thing or is it every three going to be every three months, these boosters? It depends on community transmission. Okay. And so if community transition transmission is still quite high, I imagine boosters will be more regular. But if we get to a point where community transmission declines and hospitals become less stressed, then maybe boosters will be more spaced. Unfortunately, we're not seeing a huge seasonal trend right now with coronavirus. <laughs> Seems to peak in every season. Mm -hmm. So that is that's unfortunate, right? Um, usually there is a season for respiratory infections, um, but we're seeing COVID peaks well beyond that winter time frame. So we are definitely still in pandemic mode right now. We are not in an endemic mode, um, but it seems like based on what a lot of epidemiologists and immunologists have said, it seems like we will be moving to more of an endemic level of transmission, which will still mean sickness and death, hopefully less so, and hopefully not at the level that we're seeing right now. Um, we have a very personal question that was sent to me anonymously. Um, this person says that uh, their family has been very divisive on vaccination for a long time. This person's dad is hardcore anti-vax and was so before the pandemic. And this has become even more enhanced since the pandemic hit. And now this person's mother is seeking separation. So in light of this, how can this person approach this situation empathetically to keep their relationship with their dad intact? Um, he's not so worried about the relationship with the mom, which is, I guess, quite strong, but how do you maintain a relationship with your dad in a situation like this? Wow. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your life. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I just, I know of so many situations like that where families are divided over issues like this. And I'm just, yeah, I, I lament a little bit in my spirit. Um, I don't even know what advice I could give to you. <laughs> um, that is, that's, that's heavy. And I'm just, I'm sorry. Um, I think the best thing that you can do is to keep talking. Um, and maybe there needs to be a period of time where you don't talk about vaccines, where a relationship is rebuilt. Um, I know that for some people, it's just become such a core part of their identity that they cannot imagine changing their mind on that topic. And so you almost have to wait for a period where they're, um, where it's maybe if it gets to a point where it's less personal. Um, and honestly, maybe you're not the best person to speak to them about it. Like maybe they need a friend or someone that is in a different role um, that can speak to them about this because sometimes family, it, it's a different dynamic, right? And so, yeah, I lament and I'm so sorry. And I just, I wish you well in, in your family and in your conversations. and. So don't let go of that person. 
because people change, change can happen um, and families can come back together. But yeah, I just, I wish that person well as they navigate that, that tough time. Yeah. Um, this person sent in a question at the beginning of the COVID-19 vaccinations in 2019 to 2020, we were told to trust the science and continue mm. to still follow. And I guess we continued to still follow the science. However, at the beginning, there didn't seem to be enough science to follow. We were to mm. vaccinate on blind faith. There were no test results, no information on the ingredients, no way to make an informed decision. There have been enough adverse reactions and deaths to pull vaccines from the market. And this person says, other than AstraZeneca, um, why haven't the vaccines overall been pulled from the market yet? Hmm. I I don't see any reason for the mRNA vaccines to be pulled from the market. Um, the myocarditis events that some cause in some individuals um, are minor compared to the risk of the pathogen of this pandemic, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so when we compare risks, I think there is still significant risk from the pathogen and significantly less risk from these vaccines. Uh, and it seems like that's the conclusion that health experts and those informing government decisions have, that's their conclusion as well, that when we compare risks, vaccination is still far better than repeat infection. There is a lot of, or a few studies that have come out now that have talked about some of the cumulative damage from reinfections. So I think we're just starting to understand that. There's still a lot of questions. Those studies still aren't perfect. Um, but it really is concerning that people just keep getting reinfected. Like we haven't seen that with, with any other single pathogen in history. And so it's this frequently. Um, so there, are, yeah, there are some things that we need to think about. And I, I don't know of any um, scientist, immunologist, a medical doctor that is advocating for all of the vaccines to be pulled from market. Hmm. Can you repeat some of the earlier parts of the question? Because I think there was something there that I wanted to comment on as well. Oh yeah. I have to find it again. Um, but they okay. had talked about, um, you know, trust the science when there wasn't any hmm. science available. These right. are sort of put blind trust in these untested vaccines. Yeah. The trust the science phrase came out quite early, didn't it? Um, and I, I think it was adopted because it's simple and, um, and easy to understand, but it does take away from some of the complexity and the nuance that we know exists in science. And so I understand why some people have been, you know, not liking that phrase being thrown around as much as it has been, especially early on in the pandemic where we didn't have, say, evidence that masks could prevent coronavirus in infection, but we had evidence that masks could help limit other respiratory infections. And so even though the science wasn't specific, we still had pretty good ideas on ways to move forward. Um, and I remember when Teresa Tam first started talking about the possibility of masks and how they wanted to wait for more information and they just weren't sure if now is the time to enact that and then soon we know they did. Um, a lot of people look at that, some of those press conferences and, and some of the information shared and just get really confused one minute we're not having masks and one people, everyone's, the next minute everyone's rushing out to buy fabric to make their own masks. And so a decision had to be made very fast and information was coming out very quickly and still is. And so in order to keep up with all of that scientific field, it does take quite a lot of attention. Um, and even when we didn't have a lot of science in the early days of the pandemic, we had some studies that we felt we could apply to this time, given the absence of specific studies on this novel pathogen. But I, th I think I tried my best to address that. I realized that my response was far from perfect, um, but that is a really good thing to keep talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and, and on, on that note, Rebecca, uh, you are on the, the committee for the ASA conference that's happening in Toronto in July to August of 2023. And so there will be opportunity to continue these discussions, I'm sure, uh, in person as we as we meet together there. I, I've put links in for those who came a little late to the talk with uh, Rebecca's paper on vaccine hesitancy, a link to the YouTube video of her previous talk for the CSCA on vaccine hesitancy, and a link on how to join the CSEA and sign up for uh, other 
events. We have an event on December 1st, uh, for instance, and there's the Winter Symposium coming up. We are unfortunately out of time. I feel badly because Arnold had some questions and I didn't get to Arnold's questions. They were excellent questions. You can read them, think on them, and let's take those questions with us to, uh, to Mississauga uh, in July of 2023. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time to talk uh, with us today. Uh, again, your, your uh, empathetic, uh, caring, Christ-like heart is evident in, in what you do, and you're clearly just profoundly informed and a clear communicator. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this and, and keep up the good work. Thank you for the invitation. And just thank you all of you for sticking around. There would be nothing to talk about if you didn't come with your questions. So just thanks for engaging. Mm -hmm.